For those of you who don't know us, I'm Christy and this is Joe at Foresight Wines. We're co-owners and Joe's the winemaker here. Um, we are going to work through the 13, 14, 15, and 16 Semyon. So I am um, I'm going to open my chat screen. And if you guys want to um, put in there what you're drinking, we can spend a little more time on one vintage than another. Um, that would be helpful. Since, um, we'll see how many pop on, but we get up to 40 people today. So um, chat is always really, really helpful. Um, I mean, we want to hear your voices too, but if you want to mute, unmute, and use the chat box, that would be great. Um, so we, um, this has actually kind of been my pet project, the Library of Semyon. In, um, we started making this for ourselves in, I think it was 2008, correct? Mm -hmm. First year. Mm -hmm. And we, um, we actually, it's been kind of an interesting story on how we made it, we started making Semyon on, um, on our own. We were actually selling the Semyon block that we have on the estate to another client. And we, um, they actually, their production is so large that they finally got to a year um, because they make wines from the whole county. And they're like, you know, this comes in too late. It's too small of a block. It's a third of an acre. Uh, we just, we don't know how to deal with this this year. The Sauvignon Blanc was early and the Semillon was late. And we said, um, we'll take it back. <laughs> so we started producing Semillon that year. Um, it was a little bit of a fast turnaround for us, but you know, it's a small block. So, you know, it's max a couple hundred cases any given year. And of course, all is state grown, like everything that we do. And everything you'll taste today, like most of our wines, you know, all wild yeast, wild malolactic fermentation, unfined, unfiltered. So it's still that super traditional winemaking. Um, I do have some slides um, to show you guys. So, um, oh, we're, Corvind all four, drinking the 13, awesome. Thanks guys for the comments. It gives us a good idea what to, uh, what to focus on. Um, so I have been saving Semyon um, since the beginning. And um, last year we actually released a 10 year vertical. And so it's been fun to do these little mini verticals here and there, um, just to you know give people an idea of aging white wines. Because I think, I mean, Joe, would you agree? Aged white wines is something that people don't don't generally do, especially not here in California, unless We're you're still a couple generations wines. away on the winemaking side to make enough wine that's white wine that's even age old. That then we'll have a few more generations after that that will begin to appreciate it. Hopefully, we can bake it in the cake after that. Too many bankers are making white wine, really, I think, and CPAs and CFOs. So it's made to be very fast, rapid to market, rapid cash flow, and that's not a way to make ageable red or white. So. Event, all four. so I am going to pop up some slides as everybody is joining us and we'll kind of go through um, the educational portion. This is going to be a little bit of a power hour. Uh, we are happy to stay longer, of course, as you know, and chat and talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. Um, but we are going to go through, we tried to be conservative with your time today and we're going to go through um, the semion tasting first, and then we can we can hang out as long as you want to after that. So, give me a moment here, and I'm going to share my screen with you guys. Okay, everybody can see it. Thumbs up for me. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. okay. Yep. So you know what you're attending, I'm gonna move on. <laughs> so, um, Semillon. Semillon hails from Bordeaux, France. And it is, most people don't understand, it's the most third most widely planted white wine grape in France. Mm -hmm. And there's only about a thousand acres planted in the US and three in Anderson Valley where we're based. So it's very rare in the US and very rare here. Typically in Bordeaux, they blend it with Sauvignon Blanc. Um, in Bordeaux for the white wines, the dry wines, it's Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon together. In Sauterne, the sweet wines, it's Semillon and, and Sauvignon Blanc often, but Semillon in the sweet wines is the majority because it's very susceptible to noble rot. So that Botrytis rot, do you wanna talk a little bit about Botrytis? 
Yeah, it's a mold that uh, pierces the skin of the grape and sucks the moisture out of the grape, uh, the water, and concentrates the, the sugar and acidity. And there's a lot of sweet wines made with that uh, particular style. Semillon seems to be susceptible to it in Bordeaux. I don't know necessarily, that's not been our experience, but uh, we have produced one late harvest semillon in uh, 2014. Um, which when we get to that vintage, we can talk about how that was even possible as well. So Australia also produces a lot of semion. That is where most people's references for aged semion comes from. They do actually put them away. They put them in the cellar and they re-release them later. And that is where our inspiration for semion came from. My parents had gone on a trip with some friends to Australia and brought us back a 10 year old semion that they had done entirely in stainless steel and then put away and re-released. And for us, it was one of those aha wines. We didn't really have a US reference for Semillon. And so we started trying US Semillons. And honestly, we were not terribly impressed. <laughs> so we have our own way of doing it that we've kind of designed um, for our palates. So mainly just growing it in a cool climate. This is the coolest expression of Semillon produced in California. Um, it, because it's a Bordeaux white grape, it's typically grown next to Cabernet and those other Bordeaux varietals, which I think most of you know, don't grow in Anderson Valley. We can only grow Pinot for red. So it's a, uh, it was a way for us to have something that would harvest after Pinot and not crowd the Pinot pick dates and, and still be able to retain a lot of natural acidity and ageability. In that box your parents brought back, they had two cases of wine they brought back from that particular trip. The Semillon not only was phenomenal, but it was the only bottle they brought two bottles back and might have been the only one they shared with us, to be honest. With you. <laughs> we were living real. up here at that time. So, uh, uh, but it, I, I was just like, what is this? How do you release a wine after 10 years in the cellar under mm -hmm. cork? And um, man, it was, it was mind blowing. It was great. <laughs> So our semion block, do you want to talk a little bit about our semion block and what that middle photo is, the really ugly looking bud? Yeah, the middle one is the frost from this last year. So we had a, a, one of our smaller crops of semion. It's a little bit more susceptible to frost for us, the late frost in particular. Um, the first photo we see on the left is, uh, it's the fence line. So. Uh, the, our semion, it's 0.3 of an acre by vine count. It's not a, necessarily a dedicated block of rows. It's actually what we drive by from our house, um, you know, be, uh, from our house to the winery or vice versa. Um, so it's on the outskirts of the vineyard. It doesn't, it, it gets overhead sprinkler protection and the fan, but it's right on the edge. So mm. it doesn't have fan specific or, or dedicated anything. It does bud break almost four weeks later. So it's the part of why Bordeaux varietals are grown in warmer places is warmer winters don't have as much frost and off the, a lot of these varietals, they actually bud break later. So um, I think in the most extreme case, we were talking about an eight week difference from the earliest Pinot to the last Semillon. And then almost the same would be true for pick dates as well. Um, it, it can be up to two months difference. So that middle bud, died. That middle bud, you see it's browning and mm -hmm. um, it is after this, these well, few nights of frost, it basically just shriveled up into brown leaves and fell off. So our production for this vintage of Semillon is roughly 50%. And that is something that happens from time to time I'm with that block. Less than that. Less than 50%, yeah. joy. Yeah, it's like a third. <laughs> There's only two barrels. Oh, it's a third yeah. of the 10 year average. So just picture a, uh, Somebody who uh, spends too much time on Everest and um, they don't have all their digits. I mean, that's what happened to the bud here. Basically the, the water inside the plant became a solid and ruptured the cell walls and basically it just turns black and falls off. It, it, it looks very similar to frostbite, you know, from an extreme cold exposure mm -hmm. situation. It just turns black and, and, um, and falls off and dies. And then a second bud will push out but those are very erratic when they push in, in on a varietal like this here where we're pushing the ripeness anyways. There's typically, second crop is not typically going into premium wine anyways, but part of that is because it would, it would have to restart itself. So if this bud, whatever, call it two and a half weeks, well, 
this would have to die and fall off and then the next one would have to push out. And unfortunately, this is also gonna cause a smaller crop next year because the second bud that's gonna push out, the one that's being formed in there was really supposed to be next year's bud. So what we're seeing here is actually three years of damage potentially because we lost this primary bud. Then the secondary bud had to push out because it died. And then the vine also had to have enough energy to produce next year's bud underneath it. So this is why you in the extreme northern climates um, up in Canada, Niagara on the lake, um, even some parts of the Ohio River Valley and some places that are growing grapes like that, um, you lose the whole vine. If, if you get enough of a frost, I mean, your whole vine dies back to the ground. Oh. Luckily, we don't get any of those like negative 20 degree or negative really much of anything. I've recorded a couple negatives, but super rare occasion. Um, but teens and single digit temperatures pretty much every winter, but that's not when, when the vines are growing. We're worried about that in the spring, in the very early part of the season. And so the photo on the right is just an illustration that is actually, those are Joe's hands. Mm -hmm. And that is a semion cluster. So they are very large. They have very thick berries and large berries, at least compared to the Pinot Noir, which we grow, which wouldn't even cover the palm of his hand. Um, and this actually is probably a fairly modest size wow. semion cluster. So they're very, very large. So in Pinot, it's anywhere from uh, three to six clusters to make a pound. In Semillon, we find three pound clusters and the average cluster weight is, is almost a pound. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a whole different beast. That's part of why it takes longer to ripen. It's just more fruit, mm -hmm. more, uh, more physical work that the <laughs> vine has to do to, to achieve physiological ripeness. Okay, um, we can start tasting through. I mean, I, you guys probably have already started. We really well, have. I mean, we have pre -game so. <laughs> too, but not on these ones. Hand me the 13. Um, so we are going to start with the 2013. And I'm actually, um, I'm going to go through what we have on the screen a little bit, then I'm going to stop sharing so we can chat and see you guys a little better. Uh, but the 2013 was the first year of the California drought. I mean, technically, yes, we've been in drought for a while, but this, this most recent, you know, three-ish year, um, 13, 14, 15, yeah. and it was a very long dry season, which um, you know, allowed us plenty of time for harvest and winemaking. And, you know, so it was kind of an easy harvest in that way. We had plenty of season before any rain came in. And um, as far as the wine itself, we'll talk a little bit more, but um, you can see some flavors and some pairings highlighted here. We got a lot of like lemon curd and dried citrus. You get that, you know, that aged kind of dried note and you get the barrel, which is, you know, comes through as vanilla toast to us. Of course, as Joe likes to say, he hates pairing note or flavor notes because we all taste things differently. <coughs> so um, I am gonna stop sharing now. And we'll chat a little bit about the wine. There we are. <coughs> now we can see everybody better. So 2013, looks like at least a few people have 2013s. So it's great. 2013. Yay. 2013. <laughs> so, you know, you can tell this has some age on it, right? I mean, you can <clears> tell <throat> it's not that like really fresh, fresh fruit. It, you know, it's like we said, we got a little like dried citrus, you know, note. Um, and that's, you know, that's the aging process. Do you want to tell a little bit about like how this will evolve over time, where this is going to go, how our semion goes for some time? So probably the hardest question we ever get in the tasting room is what will this wine taste like, taste like in X amount of years? And I think part of how to really answer that question is which one of these wines is the best for my palate? and then some references over time. Opening multiple bottles at a time is my favorite way to drink <clears throat> wine because you can get more context. Often the bottles aren't consumed in that night, especially at the big um, you know, industry-wide events that we would have where we would mm -hmm. taste all of a varietal or something like that. The evolution of the Semillon is especially special to me. Uh, I mean, she saved a lot, which in the beginning when we were making very little of this, I mean, we always make very little of this wine, the amount that she wanted to save, but just uh, it, uh, uh, yeah, it was, it was a lot uh, <laughs> for 10 years. Um, so, you know, now we're able to sit here and do this. And for me, the biggest thing is that when the wine is young, 
the oak expression is too strong for my palate. And that's the biggest change that I like to see in the wine, which happens somewhere in the three to five year time frame. One thing I do with the Semillon is I always put one new barrel, but of course there's exceptions to always, like I never blend and one of these wines are gonna taste has Sauvignon Blanc in it. So um, uh, that being said, um, the idea on the Semillon is to do one new barrel and one stainless drum to offset the new barrel. And then all the other barrels that we get are older. However, when we only have two barrels of it, like we have had now two vintages, the one that's in the back on the other side of the wall over here is one of them. And so we use no new barrels on it because to me, 50% new oak is just too much, even if the other 50% is stainless, especially on a white wine, it may make it more ageable. And there's a lot of things we could go down that, that, that conversation. In, for my palate, it would make it more ageable because it would just take longer for me to be able to drink it without the oak running over the wine. <laughs> So typically it's, it's anywhere from 15% um, up to about 30% new oak. Um, so 30% new oak, that's a vintage where we literally have three barrels, 33% in a new oak, 33% in a stainless drum and 33% in, in an older barrel. So you normally can count this production on one hand. One year we got this many, the rest of the years are this or smaller. So um, that's also part of why we're not interested in blending this with Sauvignon Blanc. The production of the two varietals and the flavors are so different every year um, from the vineyard standpoint that keeping them separate for a Pinot guy makes more sense to me. If there was a particular blend that we got known for and then all of a sudden one crop or the other was crashed and your blend got completely skewed, which has labeling implications, which we'll talk about later, um, it just makes it really difficult. So. Uh, it, generally speaking, I keep these separate. There's been two vintages out of, I guess if 08 was our first quick math, whatever, 16 vintages or something. No, 14. Yeah, any tasting notes about Anywho, um, yeah. that's, that's the idea. I mean, Christy I mean, likes wine older than I do. He's asking. I don't. I like wine younger than she does. I mean, it just is a, a part of our personal palate difference that, that, uh, that we understand. I like spicier food. Her family grow up with saltier food. I mean, it's, it's, it's all relative. So I put in the chat, um, any tasting notes or any questions about um, the 2013? Oh, orange blossom. Yeah. Orange blossom from the chef. <laughs> I like that. Um, does Semillon age better than other white wines? Yeah, it is theorized that the non-aromatic white varietals have more aging potential. Um, they're typically made in a different style of winemaking for that, if given the option. Um, so the only other non-aromatic white varietal that anybody here would be familiar with is Chardonnay, which is the, you know, the counterparts of Pinot Noir. Unfortunately, in Anderson Valley, Chardonnay harvests the same time as Pinot. And I would sooner make no white wine than make white wine that messed with my Pinot wine making. So I chose white wines that I could get along with from a, from a pick date standpoint. Um, and also to be able to have a lower alcohol and a, a higher natural acidity. The idea with the Semillon and Sauvignon Blanc is somewhere in the mid 12 to mid 13s. It varies a lot because we're native yeast and we're not doing any adjustments at all um, ever. Uh, no yeast addition, no acid, no water, no sugar. Um, nothing is done to these wines from that standpoint. Just try and nail the right pick date. Um, we have had to pick the Semillon a couple of times ourselves. Luckily it is a small enough block where that's possible. Um, same reason behind having to pick the Parabol ourselves a couple of times. We picked so early, basically the first people to pick Pinot in Anderson Valley, that by the time our, our stuff comes in a, a few to you know, call it three to four weeks later when this other stuff is getting riper, two to four weeks later, that's when mo that's the beginning of everybody else starting to want to have pick dates. Um, and so uh, often we've had a little more struggle with that. Luckily, white wine is um, not as susceptible to ripeness issues with the skins, the seeds of the stems like reds, which is why in the coldest places in the world, it's only white grapes. And then marginally there's Pinot. Um, and then anything after that is two one for Pinot, in my opinion. So um, up to 10 years easily on every one of these vintages. I still love clam chowder in a bread bowl all the time with Semillon. I can never hardly get past that. Um, that's just my hands down, bar none, absolute favorite meal with this wine. 
is the 2013 best now. Um, hold on, I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen again. We have a little screen that talks all about um, white wine aging and our recommendations for drinking. So I think um, since we have some questions about white wines and um, aging recommendations, um, let's pop over and check that out. And then we'll come back um, to the other vintages. So, okay. Um, so as we were talking about earlier, you know, considerations when you're thinking about aging white wines, we kind of put together a bullet list here of what we would say, uh, if you're looking at aging a white wine, you should probably think about region, of course, being one we talked about, you know, Burgundy, Germany, places that are known to be cold climate and have a reputation for nicely, you know, aging white wines. Champagne, of course, being the yes, most ageable wine course. on the planet next to port and is white wine from My apologies, winemaker, for not throwing that in there. It's okay. I didn't <laughs> want to say it because I wanted to catch you in front of everybody. Oh, <laughs> nice. Uh, style and variety. So you see I've highlighted three varieties here, Riesling, Chardonnay. I put Australian Semillon because White Bordeaux, of course, does have Semillon, but it has Sauvignon Blanc included. Australia is one of the few places in the world, I mean, other than us. It this varietally labels it. Getting yes. varietal Semillon. So those are probably, I would say, the three most notorious, you know, and, white and wine varieties. really varieties black for Riesling, oxidized brown juice made into Riesling um, to pre-oxidize those flavors to begin with. So... It's That's kind of getting a, really geeky. Yeah, it's like a winemaking <laughs> term, but they they hyper optimize the juice where they just pump it uh, and aerate it as maximum as possible before they ferment it, and the juice literally is is, is very very dark, and all of those pigments fall out, and so a lot of those uh, aromatics that are are native to that varietal when it's done in a stainless steel um, uh, fast white production are are lost before you even start fermentation. But then it gives you an opportunity to save more of the fermentation aromatics. Mm. For that matter, I mean, black Chardonnay or Semillon, I mean, we're not that far off. It's all basket pressed too. But super, like, it's darker than any apple juice you'll ever see in the tank before it actually starts bubbling. Like, it's, it's, yeah. it's scary dark for people that are used to using, like, people who work in a high sulfur winery, you know, in not, like inert gas, everything. Like, they... They get nervous. They almost pass out, and it's not from CO two. Okay, so acidity. Next bullet point: the higher, the better for aging. Same with, I mean, residual sugar. So we're talking about late harvest Semillon and Sautern. They age very well. Sugar actually is a nice preservative as well. If I can put it that way. Most ageable Semillon we've ever made: the fourteen late harvest. Mm -hmm. Not the dry. We made one in fourteen. We'll see. Uh, maybe we'll make an ice wine version of Sauvignon Blanc down the road. That will probably be our next um, experimental uh, in the ageable sweet category. Also, larger format makes wines more ageable. Uh, not as many people are selling or storing magnums uh, versus 750s. White wine is also much more popular in the half bottle, the 187 in the can format. It's true. So tannin I included on the list, a la the orange wine that we made um, from actually our orange wine this year was Sauvignon Blanc, but we have done orange wine for ourselves from Semillon. Tannin, of course, is another, you know, preservative uh, that naturally occurs in wines. So I included it, but it is rare to get much tannin in a white wine, which is why the category of orange or amber wines are so unique. Storage. 55 degrees, maso menos, little, you know, a little bit warmer, a little bit cooler on their side or upside down, of course, is the best way. You all know this. Um, I, we know you guys. And, um, you know, basic bottom line, most wines, especially white wines, are not meant to age. I mean, I would say 90 plus percent, right, Joe? No, the, the bankers is, make them expire by Thanksgiving. It's, so. it's known as the cash cow of wineries. So it is actually rare to have ageable white wines because, you know, it's, here in, in the US, we, we drink them, which is, there's nothing wrong with that, but they're not made to put down. We don't have the classification systems such as Italy, Spain, and France, where, you know, if you're growing a, a Grand Cru Burgundy, you know, th whether it's red or white, the, the winemaking protocols, the farming protocols, all that stuff is identical. You're not allowed to veer. And so it's in one of the rare cases where the white wine commands, you know, a near on par level of red wine. 
one of the big issues with white wine is that generally speaking, it commands half or less the price, which means from a vineyard standpoint, you have to have twice as much fruit in the vineyard. Otherwise you would just plant red grapes. So uh, white wine has a lot of other fiscal constraints. It costs a lot more to make for most people and inquire, it requires a ridiculous more amount of equipment in general. Um, but it's also easier to cut costs by releasing faster and using mechanization from harvesting, you know, all the way through the, uh, one of the tours we did in New Zealand on our honeymoon was of what I call the Homer Simpson style winery, which um, basically it looked like being an air traffic controller. The, they heard in the tasting room and it was off season that, you know, we were from California and it was a place we had an appointment with or whatnot. And they, they took us upstairs to see the whole facility. And you look out one side of the plate glass windows and you're 30 feet up above the air. You're looking at all the semi trucks just pulling in with all these gondolas and winches everywhere. This big old auger just churning just in this quantities of fruit is hard to comprehend. Um, and then everything's just underground pipes. And I mean, they're even able from the winemaking room to, you know, push buttons and switches to do additions of nutrients and uh, acid and water and all that kind of stuff uh, directly into the tanks. Um, there's, there's not a lot of labor in Australia and New Zealand. They don't have the same kind of labor force and, and most of their wines exported as well. So they make it in large volumes and it's, it's a neat place to go visit to, to see the best of that. Um, but it, it does uh, make it difficult. There's a lot of Semillon in Australia done in barrel, really handcrafted, almost Burgundian style Chardonnay-esque winemaking, like that bottle that we had that we researched and have had a couple other bottles of since uh, because of, I mean, that's like one of our top three bottles, at least on my like historical memory list anyways. Um, we have a question. When to age it imperfectly, it's also for your palate, which is something you have to learn because I can't answer that question for you unless you have a twin with identical life experiences. There's nobody in the world that can tell you exactly when the right bottle with the right people at the right time of day and the right moon calendar biodynamics. We can touch on that, whatever. Like, who knows? I drink wine every day. That's the hard part about fruit and flower and root days. Like, I don't not drink wine because it's a leaf day. I, that doesn't like I eat every day too. So <laughs> um, we will go, we'll jump back to the aging recommendations and the actual years. I'm assuming those interested probably read ahead when I was showing the slide, but um, we'll talk a little bit about the specific years and why um, as we get further on. There is a question about does the semion go through ML? Yes, everything we do is uh, full. Uh, the late harvest is the, um, the only white wine that we filtered to date. Um, so yeah, everything's full mallow. Uh, my opinion on mallow is that if you're blocking it, you either pick the grapes too long or you have the wrong grape in the wrong place. Blocked mallow is a totally new thing since the mid, uh, I mean, it was essentially invented. Uh, it was made possible through sterile filtration, which came about in the mid sixties, um, but wasn't really being adapted to wines until really the late eighties to early nineties in the very beginning. Um, Henzel Vineyards in, uh, in Sonoma County, they are kind of one of the pioneers of uh, tracking malactic fermentation and partial malactic fermentation and worked with many scientists to sort of even start to discover that. In Burgundy, it's basically, they just say the wines are, don't talk to me anymore, which means you, you, know, you stick your ear to the barrel, you listen to it when there's no more CO2 bubbles, when you don't hear Rice Krispie treats, the wine's done. And so all mm -hmm. wine went through that. If you don't go through mallow, you have to do crazy chemical ads and or sterile filtration or pasteurization. And none of those things are great for the wine. So um, uh, we don't make wines that, that don't go through mallow. All of our wines go through mallow, all of them. And we harvest them accordingly. We're growing varietals that work here such that that's built into the program, um, which is the entire historical context of all wine. I mean, until white wine, like I said, the late 80s to early 90s, but it, sterile filtration just wasn't applied to wine uh, until the mid to early 1960s. Previous to that, you rarely had sweet wines or off dry wines or really the, the application that most people were probably familiar with is, um, you know, Bartles and James and stuff like that. That's where sterile filtration, which was really designed in Germany for milk uh, in the, you know, early 1900s wasn't adapted to many other beverages in, until later. So uh, pasteurization is something you never want to have to do with wine. I know briefly after September 11th, they talked about doing that with all like imported products, but that doesn't, uh, people do do it on wine, but it's, uh, you remove a lot of it. Mother nature can take care of the wine for you and it can be a safe and healthy beverage. So 
We let everything bubble and let gravity settle everything to the bottom. And that's that. <laughs> All right. Um, hopefully you guys can't hear the, the snoring dog right there. Oh yeah, there she is. <laughs> Sasha, you want to come say hi? We're trying not to let her sleep much because um, without a tasting room to keep her uh, exercised and busy, yes, she's sure. been waking us up at like 5.30 in the morning, which is really nice. Um, when even our five-year-old does not wake up at 5.30 in the morning. Come here. Okay. Get a little can a subtle Sasha cameo. There's Sasha. <laughs> this is our tasting room dog for those who have not met her. She's so sweet. She has no manners. She's the worst <laughs> behaved. She's lost more of her manners than anybody I know through this whole process. Oh, they don't want to see you. They want to see Sasha. Come on. Oh, she's, no, there she yeah. goes. No, I could tell <laughs> she's she was gone. at the end of her swallow. You got her to chew on that for much longer than normal. <laughs> she is, uh, I'm probably going to let her go run around. Oh, it's prime gopher hunting season. The ground's a little soft. <laughs> want to go out and gopher hunt? No? Spray again? Yeah. So I want to go back to my nap. Yeah. <laughs> no 5.30 tomorrow morning. Anyway, that was a, an aside. Um, <laughs> shall we taste the 2014? Does anybody have the 2014 open? Yeah, all right. I got a few, oh, thumbs up. Okay, yeah, I know there's some Corvin, so there's a few of you that have it. Um, so okay. 14 is another one of these unique vintages. It was the earliest start to a vintage ever, second year of the drought. And when we were looking at the ripeness of the fruit, we realized that we had the potential, the drought, that maybe we could make a late harvest. So we left a third of the, well, about a half of the fruit hanging, but because it hung longer, it, it got a teeny bit of botrytis, about 20% on that. And the, the, the water that was pulled out of it meant that it weighed less, so it was more concentrated in sugar. So. The 2014 is another vintage, like the 2020 that's in the back, that there was no new oak used because I only made two barrels of it, I think. And so we didn't put any new oak on it. It was one or two older barrels. Um, 14 was a tough year. 13 and 14 were difficult in general from a logistical standpoint. Most people were not ready for a harvest to move up this fast. A lot of people thought 13 was a bit of an anomaly and didn't really schedule their 14 bottling dates um, or their, their bottlings for their 13 reds before the 14 harvest soon enough. And so uh, I know at least for a couple of our clients, fruit hung for you know a week and a half to two and a half weeks later than they would have liked because the entire staff and facility was still in bottling mode when these harvests just kept you know, creeping in earlier and earlier. 15 was even earlier than that. So luckily we have that fancy daffodil plot that a lot of you have heard me talk about but basically when the daffodils come up, that's when I schedule my bottling dates. Um, and we saw daffodils coming up a week to two or more weeks early in, in these drought vintages. They're, the soil was just warm. There wasn't moisture in it. You know, when we have these California dry Januaries um, at sort of uh, January or whatever you want to call it, sort of fall spring, uh, and not a lot of fog, not a lot of moisture, there's just a lot of warm sun that, that comes down during the days. The daytime highs not be, might not be very warm, but the, the day length is getting longer and, and things just wake up early. And the vines will do the same. When we go prune the vines, you can see them actually starting to leak water. And so we have an idea when the vines are starting to, to take up water. Uh, we do late pruning, or we did through these vintages, because even though harvest was earlier, we were doing double pruning to try and postpone it because the daffodils were telling us that bud break was going to be so early that we did some delayed pruning and still had the earliest pick dates um, that we could have. The delayed pruning was not only to try and push the pick date back, but it was also to, we didn't have, uh, we weren't confident of any recharge rain in the spring into the pond. Our pond is a great size to be full, but in a severe uh, a frost season, we're also typically experiencing storms in that. So there's some recharge. When that didn't happen for a couple of vintages, that's when we put the drains in the vineyard. So there's a mile and a half of rains out there that allow us to recapture. If, if our field is at capacity, we've got drains that are six feet down, French drains with the lava rock and all that stuff. And um, so in those most severe frost events when the sprinklers are going, if the ground is saturated, we're recovering all that water right back into the pond. 
So um, all those are, are kind of changes that we've had to make over the last 20 years to the property to deal with the variation of vintage. It, um, I used to say uh, in my younger days of winemaking that California has it so easy. And then 08, ever since then, I stopped talking about it. And then we go through droughts and then we do this vintage. And um, I was just uh, yesterday looking at um, harvest dates going back like 40, 45 years, I think it was for- um, That's the kind of light reading that Joe does. Yeah, the <laughs> uh, one of the most prominent Burgundian properties. And I, I went back and looked and instantly in my head, I'm going, holy crap, when was the last time they harvested in, in October? And it was like 1983. And I was like, when was the first vintage they harvested in September? And it was, I think, 2003. And I went, holy shit. It, it, excuse, pardon my, <laughs> if there's youngsters around, but um, you know, our weather station data is not that deep, but there's just been a significant change where harvest used to be late September to October in Burgundy. And all of a sudden, 40 years later, it's late August to early September. So if you're not harvesting Pinot in August right now, you're not being like Burgundy. I mean, and that's, that's our goal and why we make non-aromatic white varietal that doesn't compete with pick dates. So we're, we're doing Burgundian winemaking on Semillon as a varietal and man, fried chicken, clam chowder, and bread bowl. <laughs> <laughs> All of the above. Um, lychee, yeah, that's a good tasting note for this wine. It's definitely more exotic. Um, that's why we had like some lime zest and like a little, you know, I, I almost get a little like minerality on it right now, that wet stone kind of a note. Ceviche, that's what I want. Ooh, yeah, I think our pairing was a uh, grilled swordfish with a pineapple salsa, but that like tropical, you know, and you've got the nice meaty fish. Um, was one of our, our suggestions. Um, any, any questions anybody has about the 14? You know, one thing we didn't talk about was stemware choice, because this is kind of like one of the biggest things the family hasn't talked about in 10 years. Oh, sort of have just defaulted. those of you who've been with us long enough to taste with pretty much everybody, not just Joe, myself, but my parents way back. Um, you'll notice, well, you probably didn't notice, um, but this happens. We don't pour the semillon in the same wine glass, all of us. Um, we all have very unique. We uh, agree to disagree on that and buried that hatchet a <laughs> decade or more ago and just move forward with life. That wasn't a battle. Um, we don't disagree we about much, but stemware for semillon was an actual real conversation in the family. So we had to just say, if you're in the tasting room, you get to pour the semillon in the glass that you want. So we got the huge balloons, you know, the regular Burgundian glass and um, probably the most amount of talking I've done with Psalms is around proper stemware for this Semillon, which is the coldest expression of Semillon in the state of California. Uh, being the only Anderson Valley Appalachian uh, varietal and also being in the coldest region growing grapes in California, um, uh, that's, that's where we're at with this. So um, cool climate, non-aromatic, White grapes go in the burgundy glass, i.e. Chardonnay or a bigger balloon. Um, uh, is one side of the argument. The other side of the argument is that this is the white Bordeaux glass and that's why we even have it here is because this is the Riedel that's Sauvignon Blanc specific, but white Bordeaux is white Bordeaux. It's not necessarily Sauvignon Blanc specific. It's, um, oh yeah, we haven't talked about that in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Our tasting room hasn't really been open in a long time, so. <laughs> we also used to pour it side by side for folks to, to just, you know, to, to, again, which is the perfect wine at the perfect time for your palate? I have no idea. What's the perfect stem for you? I have no idea. The one at hand, um, it, you know, it. it uh, so when I flip flop, I'm, I'm the, the flip flopper. It depends. If it has more oak, I generally would pour it in the balloon. If it wasn't um, as oaked, I would use the this regular white wine stem. So yeah. I and we never put vintage. Pinot in these small stems. If anybody does, they get in so much trouble. I If I find red residue in this small <laughs> stems, they all know I'm hunting down how on earth that happened. I don't even care if staff or whatever, she's doing it or <laughs> It's always else. me. Like don't do it in front of the customers. She just doesn't want to do one more dish. So she <laughs> check the wines in the morning and trying to hide the stemware from you. <laughs> It's true. Yeah. I do. I do often yeah. get lazy. And when I check the Pinots before people come in, um, I just pour it in the same glass and then I rinse it out. Or sometimes I forget and I get in trouble. 
<laughs> okay. Well, now that you know all our secrets, um, <laughs> we can move on to the 2015. I am going to, unless anybody has any questions, throw it in the chat box or you're welcome to unmute yourself if you want. Um, I'm gonna go back to sharing screens. Okay, 2015. Would you like me to change you over? Yeah. So the last year of the California drought, you know, quote unquote, um, you want to talk a little bit about the vintage? Yeah, I think we got three barrels this vintage. Um, it was our earliest harvest to date. I do believe that this vintage beat it. Um, so this was also a very early year, 2020. Um, man, there was just, it didn't matter how much irrigation you tried to do, Mother Nature does just not supply enough water. And basically the vines took three normal winters to recover from the severity of these three winters in drought, in my opinion, and looking at the, the daffodil and bloom and harvest and all that. Um, so it was a small, very intense crop. Let me see the bottle. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, 12.8% yeah, 12 alcohol. So right in the middle of the realm that we were looking for it was a little bit fast and furious, this vintage. Um, I believe there was some heat spikes. I know we had all the Pinot in, in August. I think that was maybe our first year that all the Pinot was in August was. 13. We had one pick in August 14. We had half the fruit in August by 15, all the Pinot was in, in August. Um, so the Simeon was quite early, not very far after your, your birthday. Um, part of the uniqueness of vintages is uh, because we're doing non-temperature controlled natural winemaking as well is that when we have earlier vintages, earlier harvests, typically the wines will go through the fermentation a little bit quicker because the weather in September is very different than the weather in October. And with our just nighttime ventilation, you know, natural temperature cellar trying to do the best we can to duplicate underground without the building costs to dig those holes and the, the other situations with gravity that are involved there. Um, it, uh, it goes through the process a little bit faster. So, um, you know, fermentation kinetics is something that changes the flavor of the vintage, no matter what yeast you're using. You know, unless you're temperature controlling the entire environment, every wine is literally its own kind of unique self. And I do remember the 15 wines across the board being some of the, the first that were done with mallow. And so got their first dose of sulfur in like early December, typically for us. Um, like this vintage, I, yeah, you know, harvest was early, but things have been so cool after that, um, that I haven't even sent anything off for testing. It's all still talking to me. So, um, 15, you know, I remember 15 as being fast and furious as well. And it's a really short crop. It actually reminded me quite a bit of 18, um, which is the, the current Pinots that we all just moved, we moved into here. Um, but what's the real most memorable thing about what happened in February of 2015? Oh yeah, we had our son in February of 2015. So we also had a brand new baby during Somehow harvest. I made these wines with 50 <laughs> less IQ points. <laughs> At least 50 less I had IQ to run points. the tasting room and by my, yeah, it's, anyways. Woo. Yeah. yeah, 14 was when she put her little baby bump over the edge of the fermenter. Um, but 15, Evan was born in February. So in that regard, it was a, a unique vintage. And by the next year, he was already making orange wine. So <laughs> yeah, put him to work at one. Um, <laughs> oh, hold on. I see Laurie, you're talking, but hold on. Um, I'm going to see if I can unmute. You guys have to unmute yourself. I can't hear you. February 3rd to be exact. <laughs> You remember, my goodness. It's my birthday too. Oh, <laughs> that's right. I'd forgotten you share it. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, you'll never forget Evan's birthday, ever. No, and no. now we won't forget yours, hopefully. Well, sometimes I forget. <laughs> it does, um, as the years go by, I mean, I have a harvest birthday in September, so it's like I lose. Yeah, September. I Nine, I'm nine nine. Oh. Nine nine eighty one. Uh-huh. A math. Should you you want to give out my social? Um, a mathematician. <laughs> that's how I can remember it. Nine times nine is eighty-one. Hey, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he has uh, a formula for everything. <laughs> exactly. I was just on a Zoom today. Sorry, aside. 
with a community college uh, math conference uh, attendees. And I talked a lot about Joe and his love of math. This whole math conference bought this wine sampler and then they, as in between their math conference, they took a break and drank wine with Christy for an hour earlier today. Uh, uh, earlier yeah. today? Yeah, this is, yeah, earlier. Whoa. I had to pace myself today. Yikes. Um, yeah. Okay, so we do have a question and it is, do you shoot for a specific bricks on semion ripeness or do you pick on a variety of metrics? Yeah, there's a 11 point checklist. The first three are horrible. It's can I get a crew? Can the yeah. can I get a truck? Can the winery accept the fruit? All those uh -huh. things for me are not an issue, but that's my checklist that I developed over the years working with other folks. Um, bricks are important. Um, however, uh, you know, in Burgundy, nobody uses the term bricks. They use potential degrees alcohol. And one of the largest reasons that our semion varies in alcohol is one, we're not inoculating for a known yeast strain and two, um, measured bricks does not, like if bricks is X, Y is not the alcohol. There's quite a wide range depending on how you ferment it. If you use sulfur, if it's open top, closed top, if it's inoculated or native, temperature control or not, um, all these are, are factors in that. So um, the white wines for us actually vary a lot more in regards to the final alcohols based on a given bricks. But typically the Semillon um, is coming in somewhere in the upper 19s to like mid to low 20s. Um, not very ripe by most standards. I mean, growing these varietals here, I, I've never talked to anybody who's ever made Sauvignon Blanc or Semillon in warmer regions like Napa Valley that has any idea how we, like are able to pick fruit that just doesn't taste like a, a bag of um, green bell peppers and jalapenos uh, stuck in a Vitamax. Um, a lot of that has to do with farming. A lot of it's the winemaking style. There's also nobody in these warmer regions using a pneumatic basket press uh, to specifically make sure you're leaving behind the mechanical bitterness in the wine, you know, in the press. Uh, mechanical bitterness is something that can only come from over-processing grapes. And unfortunately, because white wine cannot command the same price points. It's the first one to have mechanization applied to it. And over-processing white grapes can bring a lot of mechanical bitterness, green, bitter, astringent flavors, which is where all the animal proteins, the eggs, milk, and fish come from to then strip all that mechanical bitterness back out. So we use our wooden slatted basket press, champagne style press for this varietal. And part of our low tonnage is that we only get two barrels out of a ton of grapes which is, it's a Spanish champagne machine. In champagne, you're only allowed to get 120 gallons out of a ton of grapes. And so many wineries would get a third barrel. The problem is the third barrel tastes like shit. They're just, there's so much sediment. You've broken so many of the seeds and the stems. Um, you, in, in a lot of cases, you've distemmed the fruit to begin with before even putting it in the distemmer so you can fit more fruit, thus also having another lighting change and economic. Sorry, it's okay. <laughs> our energy saving lights decided we left. <laughs> so, they, they so I just had to turn them back on for <laughs> so you guys could see us. <laughs> so that, yeah, this, this is a, it's a very uneconomical way to make white wine because we're feeding a bunch of liquid to the cows, but it makes better wine that I don't have to mess with later. A lot of people forget the more you rack the wine, the more you filter the wine, the more you find the wine, every single thing you do to the wine, you're losing volume. If you just leave the wine alone, you know, every time you touch it, you're not getting every drip out of every tank. You're not getting every drip out of every barrel. You're not getting every drip out of every hose. Every time you touch a wine, you're losing volume, with the only exception being topping when I'm adding more wine back into the barrels. But um, we try and just do the set it and forget it kind of thing, low and slow, farm to table. I don't know what the anal uh, any other analogies are on that. You have plenty. Um we probably, I know we're running up against five. Hopefully you guys can stay a little bit longer. Um, I think we should flip over to the 25th or the 2016. Um, so we get a chance to taste it and we can talk a little bit about um, aging recommendations. So let me share back for a minute. Okay, so 2016. Would you like to talk about the year, Joe? Sure, yeah. You know. Normally I don't blend wine, but this is one of the two vintages that we did. This one has 20% Sauvignon Blanc. Um, 
it's a little bit of a riper version. 2016 was the first year that we had regular rainfall, but even though we had a great winter, it's a great ski season, real wet winter, I think, I don't know, almost 80 inches or something like that. We thought, great, the vines will be totally caught up. And then the daffodils sprouted early. And then the vines woke up early. And then they set a uh, decent sized crop as well. And um, this is also one of those uh, examples, like I was just talking about, about the, the alcohol being different. The particular ratio of glucose to fructose in this vintage was different than we had seen in the past. And the corresponding alcohol, I think is the highest that we've made um, for the Semion at 13.9. Um, so still not, uh, the nose is still got that touch of Sauvignon Blanc. And with time, the Sauvignon Blanc aromatics kind of pull behind. And as this wine gets older, it'll be harder to tell that there is a little bit of Sauvignon Blanc in it. Um, so we taste blends every single year. That's something that, quite frankly, I thought was the easiest way to ask the question, do you blend and why not? So we blend our Pinots when we do blending trials with the Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon every single year. Uh, generally, it's just one blending trial. I'll do one at a 5% add, one at 10, one at 15, and one at 20. So we sit down with, with eight glasses, four of Sauvignon Blanc that have 5%, 10 15 and 20 of Semion, and then the other four glasses are that complete thing flipped the other way. And there's only been two vintages we ever thought it made the wine better, and this is one of them, um, and quite a bit. I think the other one we did, it was 8% Semion into the Sauvignon Blanc. So we've also only done Sauvignon Blanc in a Semion once, and we've only done Semion in a Sauvignon Blanc once. So, you know, if you don't do the work, you don't know. I mean, it could just be a day we just decide to go bike riding or not show up to work or go to the beach or crab fishing or skiing or something. Instead, we come to work, we do the work. Most of the time it results in nothing, but at least we're here doing the work. And in a vintage like this or the other one, we go, wait a second, we need to pause here. So with this vintage, because we liked maybe the 15 and 20%, then I would have made the next tasting the next day or whenever the calendar was soon, a day or two later, then we would come into eight glasses but it would be like 6%, 8%, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, or you know, right up to the legal limit at 25. Um, and then if we found a range there where it was like, oh, somewhere between 18 and 20, then we would come in again and do another six or eight glasses that would be uh, you know, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. And you just keep you know, making those decimals smaller until you get to the, the happiest place. Um, it's pretty amazing. I mean, even that couple of percent, um, you know, we'll taste through and it'll be like, you know, 8%, you still, it's still predominantly semi-on, you have, you know, whatever the attractiveness you're looking for from the Sauvignon Blanc for that vintage, but you go to 10 and it starts to taste like Sauvignon Blanc. So there's a very fine line at which one varietal kind of takes over. Um, so we're still trying to keep it true to what it is but just enhance it in those years where we feel like the blend is a little bit better. That'll be my explanation. So. Acidities vary every year. That's um, something we're always looking at. That's uh, a secondary kind of level of, of questions, but we still want the wine to be dominated by the varietal that's on the label because you can put 25% up to other stuff. So it's not on the label, it's on the tech sheet and, and Obviously, you know, we're not uh, trying to hide that. There's um, been many a time we've been to other producers that we sell our grapes to, specifically the white wines, and we'll taste uh, all the, you know, we'll show up and there'll be six or eight wines. And it's like, oh, we only sold you Sauvignon Blanc. I didn't realize we we're going to be in six of your blendings, but sometimes grapes are so good. People are used 2% and something else or 4% and something else to, to make it with, you know, with no disclosures, it's all like whatever behind the scenes type stuff. But um, there's been a few cases where some Anderson Valley Sauvignon Blanc showed up that tasted identical to one of our vintages. Um, and so, you know, nobody talks and it's all NDAs, but, you know, sometimes the palate knows what it knows. So it's Cindy, who has a 2016 um, that they're drinking right now? All right, got a few. Yeah, it's kind of fun. Um, I mean, it's definitely different than the 2013. You just go a few vintages and you know, this one with between the Sauvignon Blanc, which all adds that, you know, more of the floral and the really fresh uh, fruit, the very aromatic. 
And the, of course, it being a much newer vintage, you know, as it, as it changes, as it ages, you'll lose that really fresh nose. It's been interesting. We've, we've aged Sauvignon Blanc. And you, some of you have had our aged Sauvignon Blanc at uh, Library Vertical. It's the one I want to age. <laughs> and, you know, works. it just, it does not go over as well. It's, you know. It's, it's not just, I mean, our palate, I mean, up to five to seven years, no issue. It's not like you have to drink ours tomorrow, but every time we've poured older Sauvignon Blanc at library wine events or at club parties and stuff, it's um, it never sells itself. Let's put it that way. Like it's it's a fun ex like taste experiment. But um, there are people who really like it, but they overwhelmingly generally the crowd prefers aged Semillon, and so that kind of goes to the case in point of it's you know the non aromatic white varieties. It's you know Sauvignon Blanc you do lose that really beautiful nose, which is kind of why that freshness and that, that you know, delicate nose is why people drink the Sauvignon Blanc. The Semillon, it does, it just seems to do better over time. So I'm gonna go back to our aging recommendations here. Okay, there we go, okay. Um, the winemaker's aging recommendations. So Joe, do you want to kind of go through these a little bit? Yeah. And again, it's a very, very personal thing. When somebody says drink now through 2024 for 13 or drink now through 2025, that just means anywhere in between. If you know your palate tends to like older wines, like Christy does, that's at the tail end of the spectrum. Um, if you're someone like myself who's had wine that's over the hill too many times in my life maybe i am a little more cautious when it comes to pinot and and some whites but um so much of the perfect wine on the perfect day at the perfect time for you is is um it's not i don't know when you look back on those crazy special bottles you can't add anything up about that now um less with this wine but in general you know, there's other resources you can use as well. Seller Tracker is a um, like an online uh, system that allows you to track your own personal seller and people share tasting notes on there. And so you can see tasting notes, how other people are drinking that wine. I think one of the hardest things to do about when is this wine right for me is if you're buying one bottle of something, most likely it should probably be on the sooner side. You know, with our collecting over the years, it's been more the four, you know, three, four, six, twelve you know, kind of scenario. And then as time's gone on, it's more wine from fewer producers from fewer places and stuff like that. But where you can taste a bottle kind of year over year over year. Um, now, I'm sure anybody who was in the tasting room in 2015 or 16, when I was pouring the 2013 Semillon, and I was like, oh, you know, this can go another five to seven years. You know, if you believed me and you bought that wine, it just white is not something people uh, domestically, you know, default to, to thinking about as, as being quite as ageable. Um, but there's just, there's, there's a lot of factors there. There's no, there's no perfect time. Um, but as far as, you know, wine can't make you sick. It's never going to be over the hill. It's just more going to be as your preference. Like I grew up in a house that only cooked well done steak. I didn't know any better. Oh my God, that's not my preference. Like I know. Um, so, uh, you know, but you also have to have a Pinot that's too old for you or a Pinot that's too oaky for you or an, a white wine that's a Semillon that's too sweet for you or too old for you or, you know, too young of wine. It's just wine that isn't, um, it's just not appealing, you know, and I guess at the, at the other end of the spectrum as well, too old of wine is maybe not appealing, but young wine just needs time to kind of settle down. So typically with the Semillon, you know, we're releasing at the same time as the Pinot. It's doing 20 months in bottle before we even release it. Uh, it's, it's a varietal on the winemaking side that tends to be reductive and accepts oxygen very slowly. And that's part of what allows it to potentially age longer if you have storage and a palate and time and energy on that right night, you know, with the clam chowder and a bread bowl. <laughs> Back to the clam chowder. Um, so just to run through it quickly, I'm sure you've read it. 2013, our recommendations are now through 2024. 2014 now through 2025, 2015 now through 2027. And then we reduced the 2016 just because of that Sauvignon Blanc inclusion, you're gonna lose that, that those delicate notes in the nose. It will structurally last longer, of course, being younger, but um, 
You got I foresee a future that. library wine tasting where the 14 late harvest is poured next to the 14 Semillon and the 16 Semillon is poured next to the 16 Sauvignon Blanc. It'd be fun. Because you could actually watch the aging curve on the 16 Sauvignon Blanc to help predict a little better because it is 20% of the one in the Semillon. So a couple additional comments. Um, so Michael opened a 17 and noticed a big difference in oak versus the 13. Yeah, the, uh, the, the youngness mainly. I think that was 17, uh, well, a pretty decent year for production. I think we had five barrels. So that one would only be 20% new oak, 20% stainless. If my memory serves, I'm sure it's on their website somewhere. Um, uh, but when wines are younger, the oak is gonna show more. And the reason that we barrel ferment the Semillon in the new oak is because you do lose a lot of the heavy, strong oak characters like right out of the fermentation. Also all the yeast and lees and heat that's created um, kind of subdues the, the flavor. Uh, I get this question a lot when we talk about the 0% new oak Pinot because people go, oh, well, what was the barrel before that? And then I mentioned that in Burgundy, there was no new oak used until 1982 when Henri Jair had his epiphany. Well, the barrels had something before, it was either water or Chardonnay. But when you barrel ferment Chardonnay, you, if you were to barrel ferment in the barrel and age it in that same barrel, you wouldn't get the same amount of oak flavor on the final wine. Yes, that one barrel would be 100% new oak. But if you ferment it in stainless and then transferred a clean, clear wine to the new oak, you would perceive that oak you know, up to two to three times of the impact. And so that's also a way that wineries you know, use to lower their oak expenditures is to transfer wine into a smaller percentage of new oak, but that extracts the whole flavor. For me, I'm kind of trying to do the opposite. I'm trying to take and neutralize as much of that new oak. But another part of a program, a white wine program, is that you have to integrate some new barrels. Otherwise, I'm going to have to rely on other wineries for wood. And because we're all native yeast and I, I, don't, I don't want any inoculated Chardonnay barrels in this facility, never, ever. It's not going to happen. Chardonnay barrels, they're not even allowed to be burned on a campfire stove. Like, no. Um, so we don't want any of those bugs here. So part of just keeping a white wine kind of barrel program and regime and being able to barrel ferment the Vin Gris and continue to produce more Sauvignon Blanc, that's, that's sort of all part of it, but it's literally one medium toast long Ramon Allier uh, barrel. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very custom specific selection um, for this wine. And so, yeah, as time goes on, the oak will pull back a little bit. Um, and then in the years when I only have two barrels, I, I don't do any. And that barrel just sits and waits until next year to get a Sharpie pen. <laughs> All right. Uh, a few tasty notes. Lori says, smells like guava and quince, underripe pineapple. Yeah, definitely. Um, and Linda wants to know about aging for the 2017 and the 2018. I mean, again, up to this 10 year sort of time frame, there's nothing, if anything, the 17 and 18 should be more ageable than the ones that we went through here because of the drought situation. I believe the acidities are higher um, and the pHs are lower because things were just more normal. Um, and then, you know, in a perfect world, the winemaker gets better every year. The <laughs> farmer gets better every year. So, you know, we're, we're really honing in on some you know, really hyper micro, I mean, straight up OCD details when it comes now to like berry sampling. And um, in the early vintages, my communication with the farmer was more through a mediator. <laughs> um, uh, Everybody gets a little tense around a harvest. <laughs> and it, there's not a harvest that goes by, I don't hear him repeating something that's my sentence that he's repeating to a client on the phone or the farming company. And so, um, uh, you know, we, we've all, you know, we've all evolved in different ways and he's learned how much more efficient the farming is for the type of wine we want to make, how much less inputs herbicide, fungicide, pesticide that early pick dates have to play in the scenario. Um, there's just a, a lot of great things to letting mother nature kind of self-regulate the crop load. 